We are now. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so we will be, we are recording today's session. So uh, Sam said earlier, if you know someone who couldn't make it, um, you guys can share this. And Sam, you said that it would be on, where else can they find it? It'll be on our YouTube channel and our website. Perfect. Awesome. All right, so my name is Heather Blevins. I work in the Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships. Um, and today we'll be talking about loans and repayment. Uh, I do welcome questions throughout, but I may ask you to hold the question until later if the subject is gonna be coming up. Um, so we will talk all things loans and we will get into repayment and just some general financial tips uh, around the subjects. So today my goal is to prepare you guys for student loan repayment, but also to encourage healthy financial habits, uh, as well as providing some resources um, for you throughout the process. I do like to start with the basics because I don't ever like to assume that people um, know this subject. So I do always like to start with the cost of attendance or what I will reference as the COA. Now that is always an intimidating number, no matter if you're at MSU uh, Denver, which is a very affordable institution within the state of Colorado, or if you're anywhere. Um, every institution that receives federal financial aid is required to provide the cost of attendance for students, but it is just what I like to call a sticker price. So it is not direct, it is not necessarily what you're going to pay, but instead just a number that's designed for the purpose of making sure that you have everything that you need to be successful. So for example, we have the tuition and fees. Um, and this is just these aren't the exact numbers per se, but um, I believe this is reflective of 2021, but don't quote me on that. It's just really for the visualization. So let's not get too hung up on the numbers, but the tuition and fees is what we consider a direct cost here at MSU Denver. So that's what you're actually going to see on your bill for the full year. Um, it is broken down in semester by semester. So fall and spring commonly, summer if you choose to attend. But you'll see that there's a budget for room and board, which is housing and dining. Although we don't offer those services on our campus per se. You don't pay us, MSU Denver, the same way you pay your tuition and fees for room and board. Um, same thing, excuse me, with books and supplies. Um, that is just a budget. A lot of students are fortunate and able to rent their books um, or even borrow them from a local library. If you're not already doing that, I do recommend um, you look into both options. Always check with your library because you could like check books out for free potentially. You do have to be ahead of the game. So I recommend looking early rather than kind of wait to the last minute. Um, or you can look up sites and just rent your books in which you would just rent it for the semester and send it back at the end. And you don't have a pile of books that you'll never use again. Um, miscellaneous and personal expenses and health insurance. Uh, you guys know that uh, MSU Denver, we do require students to carry health insurance. And if they, um, if you do not have your own insurance, you, we do require you to have the institutional insurance. And that is something you have to waive out of every year. So, or every semester, I apologize. So the total cost of attendance, again, we're just gonna use this for reference. Um, Cause I want to get into the next slide to really show you guys in what instance you may need a loan. Not every student needs loans. Uh, but it is common for students to need them. And so we'll talk about federal loans as well as private and other options. So this sticker price is 30925 Lots of money for one year of school, considering that you on average would go to school at least four years for a bachelor's degree. That adds up very quickly. All right, so I wanted to provide a cost of attendance compared to awards to kind of show you guys the uh, like where the numbers come in. So tuition and fees are the only direct thing that you are billed for here at MSU Denver. Um, and so again, I just use the what the current semester fees are. 
So it's about $8,000. Um, we'll round up, say $8,100. Let, and then below the second like table that you'll see is an example financial aid package. And so some students may receive the federal Pell Grant, the CCRG, and then we always offer, if you've completed a FAFSA application, we've always, we always offer the federal subsidized loan and unsubsidized loan. Um, however, that does not mean you have to accept them. So you'll see that the example that I use is almost $15,000. Now your bill is only gonna be that 8,000 for the year. And so you definitely don't need the almost $15,000 um, to cover just your tuition and fees. However, if you think back on that sticker price we were just talking about, if you do need assistance to pay for your housing or groceries, your books and supplies, maybe you're a science major and those books require, you know, the most current uh, edition and sometimes there's supplemental fees and things like that. You may need additional money to cover your necessary expenses. Um, and that can fluctuate year to year, depending, it can even fluctuate semester to semester. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, anytime you get a grant or a scholarship, those monies are considered free or um, gift aid. So we accept them on your behalf because we assume students want the free money, um, meaning you do not have to repay those. Whereas if you're offered the subsidized and unsubsidized loan, it is offered to you. However, it is not something under any circumstance that can be accepted on your behalf. Um, so we offer it. Um, and there are other options that we do not list on the financial aid package. So it's always good to reach out to the financial aid office. And I always recommend having an appointment where you have a one-on-one -on -one with a counselor. Um, due to COVID and us being Roomba, we are still doing those meetings and they are happening over Microsoft Teams. Um, and, but you can schedule them the same way um, through Navigate. So we'll go over different types of loans and how to obtain them. Uh, and I will go in depth. I also tried to provide, um, Sam, I'll provide, I can provide you with this PowerPoint. I wanted the PowerPoint to be able to stand alone if people are referencing it without like watching or listening to the recording. Um, so the FAFSA application does automatically offer students federal loans. Um, some may be eligible for a subsidized loan some students may only be eligible for an unsubsidized loan. And so the difference between the two is one, the Department of Education pays the interest while you're in school, which is the subsidized loan. And then the unsubsidized does typically accrue interest while you're enrolled in school, at least half time, which as an undergraduate student is six credit hours here at MSU. Uh, but repayment itself between both of these loans are deferred while you're enrolled at least half time. Um, and and it, there's a six month grace period after you either graduate or stop attending half time. So if you do take time off there, it's not like your loans are immediately going to be entering repayment, um, but it is good for everyone to be aware um, that that grace period starts. So if you're out of school for more than six months, then enter, um, your repayment will begin. When students accept a loan, they complete what's called the uh, master promissory note. And that requires students to give several references. Um, and that's in the event that your phone number changes, your address changes, and they try to contact you via mail or by phone uh, or even email, and they're not able to get a hold of you. Um, it's just not everyone updates those things or remembers to update those things. So it, they will ask for a couple references and it's solely for the purpose of contacting you. There is what's called a parent plus loan option. If you are offered grants, scholarships, or maybe just loans, and regardless, your financial aid package is simply not enough to cover your necessary expenses. And again, that may only include your tuition and fees. However, for some folks, you may need assistance. Maybe you're not able to work or you simply don't want to. Um, and maybe you as a family can afford um, to take out more loans and live off of, 
live off of them while you're in school. Um, a lot of students will only opt to work in the summer and that's totally acceptable. Everyone's situation is totally different. So um, my goal is to try to hit every group in this presentation and, and talk about like all the options so that if it applies, you have the information. The Parent PLUS loan is a separate application from the FAFSA application. So again, the FAFSA application does automatically offer you either the federal subsidized and unsubsidized or solely the unsubsidized loan, whatever you're eligible for. But the Parent PLUS loan is a separate loan. It is federal. Um, federal loans do very commonly in almost all situations um, have a much lower interest rate and they are fixed, which means that they will forever be that interest rate for the lifetime of the loan, whether it takes you three years to pay it off or 13 years. I'm just throwing numbers out. Um, but the federal or the parent plus loan application is a loan that is in the parent's name. Now it can only be taken out for you as a student but it is not your legal or financial responsibility. And that's something that's really important and is the parent's responsibility to read all of the, the fine print of everything that they're signing um, so that they understand that it is not something that they can transfer over to you. Um, some parents and families decide that that's the best option for them. You know, Maybe parents are in a place where they can and want to help their student. Um, it does require an, uh, like a FICO uh, credit score check, as well as a debt to income, um, just check to make sure that you're not like taking out more than you need. Um, but there's also another popular option. And again, it just kind of depends on a couple of things. There is an alternative or private loans. Those alternative loans or private loans are used interchangeable. So I wanted to include both those there. Um, some schools offer their own loans at the institution. However, MSU Denver does not. So I provided elmselect.com. That is the website where we provide uh, students, it's like a comparison tool so that you can compare one lender to another and some lenders have several options. Um, so it's important that you look for, you know, if you're an undergraduate student, make sure you're not looking for a graduate student loan, things like that. We do not endorse any one particular lender, so we're ne you're never going to hear the financial aid say, um, go with this lender over this one, but Elm Select is specifically with lenders we have a relationship with. So other students at, the, at this institution have current loans with those organizations. Um, we don't add anyone on there if we don't have a relationship with them. There are additional steps. I always like to tell people that accepting loans is a three-step process. So for federal loans, you have to first accept it in your student hub. Um, then you have to complete the master promissory note and entrance counseling. I am pretty, I'm biased for the entrance counseling. I really liked it. Um, and I still continue to take loans as I'm a graduate student currently. Um, I think that it's very educational. So I do recommend that people take it seriously when they're doing it. Um, you may not actually need this information. Maybe you're fortunate and you don't need a loan right now. But I had a senior who's graduating this semester who circumstances have changed in their life and they need a loan for the first time. So that entrance counseling is going to be very beneficial for that student because maybe they you know, attended something similar like you guys are attending right now, um, but that information is completely left her brain. Um, and so that entrance counseling will give her all the ins and outs to make sure that nothing is missed. If um, your parent is doing a parent plus loan, um, there may be an endorser agreement, which is basically a co-signer. If your parent is not eligible um, for the parent plus loan based on their credit, alone, they do have the option to either get a co-signer, which is called an endorser for the federal plus loan. Um, and all of this stuff is, I think, well communicated to students. When you submit an application, say for the plus loan, it will notify your parent on the screen 
like you have not been accepted. However, these are your options. And one of that is explain the endorser and everything that they need to do if that is the route that they want to go. However, if your parent doesn't have someone who can be an endorser or perhaps they just don't wanna go that route, um, if they are denied, a student can be offered additional unsubsidized loan as a result of that denial. And then alternative loans, if that is the route that you want to go, um, it is typically in the student's name with a parent co-signer. That way the student is building, it's a, it's a way that you can build credit. Um, I don't recommend it if your purpose of getting it is solely to build credit. There are other ways to do that, but um, it is a benefit if it is something that you need uh, because you're kind of you're working on that simultaneously. And so all of this stuff is going to be outlined to you uh, when you complete applications. Um, if you're doing an alternative or private loan, they're gonna your lender that you choose is going to notify you and let you know what you need to do next. Um, and as well as try to give you a timeline of like how much, how long you can wait for this um, or expect the school to get those funds. And again, I know that this is a lot of information and the information is pretty dry. Um, so that is why we are recording it <laughs> and providing the PowerPoint. Um, the second most important thing, so after you get a loan or, choose, or um, decide that you need one and you go through the steps, it is very, very important that you understand that you do have to maintain eligibility for it. It is not something, while every student is offered the federal loans as a result of completing the FAFSA application, that does not mean that you are um, eligible or guaranteed that money for life. Um, you do have to be making progress. And so there are three components to the satisfactory academic progress. And we call it SAP for short. Um, it is something that every institution that has federal financial aid does have to have. However, those things can change. So if you're thinking about doing undergraduate here at MSU, but then maybe going graduate somewhere else, um, just know that it, satisfactory academic progress is different at every institution, or it can be, um, as well as it can be different even here at MSU Denver, it is a little different between undergraduate and graduate students, which is very important to know. Um, so as an undergraduate, um, it is a 2.0 cumulative GPA. You must complete at least 67% of your coursework. And so 67% um, or better, um, and then in parentheses, I put that uh, the equation for that is your courses, your credit hours completed divided by the course is or the credit hours that you have taken. And that's how we determine that percentage. Um, and it does not round. So if you're at 66.9, it does not matter. It's not going to round. Um, you must be doing that. So and one way that students completion rate may drop is if students make it a habit to drop all of their courses or to, which is completely understandable because life happens and, and sometimes that's for our best mental health or um, you know maybe circumstances beyond our control. Um, so I don't, it's not to discourage students from life happening and, and feeling like you're doomed. Um, it's definitely not that. There is a grace, like I said, it's if you're completing all of your courses, um, earning grades in them 100% and then you have a bad semester, it's not gonna drop it substantially. Um, to 67. So it usually takes a couple semesters for students dropping courses um, for that really to impact them. So again, not a scare tactic at all. Um, and that maximum time frame is um, MTF for short. Again, I tried to, I spelled everything out, but I did want to put some acronyms in there just for reference in case I slip. Um, but maximum time frame does provide 150% of credit allowance that it takes to complete a degree. So for example, if it takes 120 credit hours to complete a bachelor's degree, um, then it would be 180 credits is the maximum that you can take. Um, so that does allow for students to change majors, that does allow for students you know, dropping or having to retake classes. Um, and that's why that 150% is built in there because we know that people are gonna change their mind 
life is going to happen throughout a course of um, someone completing their coursework. Um, and like I said, as a graduate student, those numbers are different. It doesn't take 120 credit hours to complete a master's degree, uh, but that does vary by program. So it is 150% of whatever it takes for your specific degree. And loans do require minimum enrollment. Um, federal is always 100%, it's half time enrollment. So that is six credit hours for undergraduate, four credit hours for graduate students. Those are the numbers here at MSU Denver. Um, and again, that can vary if you move on to another school, say for graduate school. Alternative loans, it will depend on the lender. Um, so it is important that you understand what their expectations are of you. A lot of them, um, majority, are the six credit hour, like the minimum half-time enrollment. However, there are select few that do not have a minimum enrollment requirement. Um, there are also private loans that require a student to be meeting their SAP policy, meaning um, all the things above, they're meeting the terms of that. Uh, there are lenders, though, that are specifically out there for students who are not meeting those standards um, so that students can still afford to work towards their degree, even if they're working on improving their SAP status. Heather, I have two questions. Yes. The first one is, for I've never heard of the last thing that you just said about lenders that are willing to work with students who are not meeting the 2.0 or the 67 completion rate. And then the last one, uh -huh. do you know with the ELM select, is that, are those people on that list or is there another list yes. that we could see? Yes. Um, let me see if I can actually go out to the website. One second. Can you guys still see my screen that I'm pulling up a web browser? Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. So I am actually going to, um, I was thinking about putting this in the PowerPoint, but I kind of figured if the question came up, I'd just go to the website because this is very important. And I think um, a lot more students need it um, especially as life is, has completely turned upside down for everyone. Mm -hmm. So this is elmselect.com. Um, mm -hmm. And then you just type in what school you're at. And then it will ask you what program you're working on. So again, undergraduate, graduate, parent loans, whatever you're looking for. So let's go with undergraduate. Um, this is just stating that we do not endorse any one lender and that this is just for educational comparison purposes. Mm -hmm. And so this is what will happen um, on without any filtering. Um, I always personally, when I am meeting with students one on one, I always recommend the first thing that you do is select fixed interest rates only because that is, again, similar to the federal loans where you're going to get your interest rate for your lifetime because bad things can happen if you do the variable. <laughs> I don't know for certain that it's like this for everyone, but I always share my personal experience. I received a private loan for my freshman year of college and my dad had great credit. Um, he was helping me build my credit um, and by getting the private loan, it was helping. Um, so we got a $5,000 loan. I believe our interest rate was around like five or 6%. Um, that also does take in consideration what's happening in the world too. So, um, what's happening in politics and all of that stuff does impact those numbers. Um, for example, like low during one season of life, maybe an interest rate, no lower than 8%, whereas another maybe 3%. It's the same thing if you're buying a car or buying a house, the interest rate just fluctuates. But when I graduated four years later, as soon as I graduated, my interest rate shot up to 11% because I had a variable and we were not educated. Um, I was a first generation student. My dad had done well for himself and, and other ways of like building credit and stuff, but he himself had never bought a house, never got um, a car loan or anything like that at that point in life. So 
we were completely clueless. And so I always share that mm -hmm. horrific experience so that other students don't get that same thing happen to them. So I always say that. And so um, it didn't look, it didn't narrow it down a ton, um, but it did make sure that it's only going to show me fixed rates only. Mm -hmm. Next, I tell students to go over here in the filter mm -hmm. and you can, uh, there's a couple things that you can look at. So depending on what your situation is. So when students are not meeting SAT, so it says satisfactory academic progress required, no. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, so let's say I'm not meeting standards. So mm -hmm. now you see that it uh, trimmed it down to eight different loans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, if you... <clears throat> Say you're not meeting that and you have a balance. Um, you can do that as well. Um, so just as much as we need um, student options for those who are not meeting SAP, we also have um, a large amount of students who are um, having or, or struggling with the past due balance. Mm -hmm. So they can filter it that way as well. Or if the situation is no on the rest, but they are less than half time enrolled, they can filter it for that purpose as well. Mm -hmm. So um, great options here. I love the search tool. I love that they're that we've finally put something together. Um, we started using this about two years ago. Um, I think it's just so helpful, yeah. but it's as long as if someone is um, taught how to use it, right? So hopefully this has helped. Um, mm -hmm. It does like specify repayment type. Um, so yes. if you are someone who is really fixated on um, paying that loan down as soon as possible, you can certainly search um, by repayment type as well. And so um, just a little, a quick explanation. Immediate repayment is there's no grace period. So you're going to start repaying this right away. Most students don't want that <laughs> or parents. Um, yeah. Principal and interest deferred, um, meaning that it's deferred until you graduate or stop attending half time. Um, maybe you do want to pay your interest only while you're in school. And so filtering this will allow you to see um, who allows that, those options. Um, so that's a really. That's awesome. I think that I, everybody offers that. That's why it's not really filtering anything, but. Can I ask another question since we're on this topic? And yeah. if you're thinking to yourself, man, I'm curious about, or I wish you'd clarify Go ahead and put it in the chat or you can unmute. But my other question about this is I'm noticing these have really high interest rates. What do they base that on? So good question. Um, these are ranges. Mm -hmm. So it depends. The way that I always like to explain um, to families of the difference between like the parent plus and private loans, which are all of these included here. Um, the Parent PLUS loan is easier to get approved for, mm -hmm. um, even if the parent doesn't have such great credit. However, I caution people because um, the, the Parent PLUS loan is in the parent's name forever. And so if you're banking on your student paying that, um, you may wanna try to go the route of your student doing it with a cosigner. Um, with a private loan. Um, so it, it really depends on the person. And I always welcome people to have that conversation with us if you're on the fence or you just don't know, because um, you can share with us what your personal situation is. Um, but these, these very like, so this is a fixed interest rate, right? 4.24% to 12.99. That means that that is going to be your fixed interest rate is going to fall in the range somewhere between there. So I always tell people like private lenders are tricky because variable, this one looks sexier, if you will, or even comparing these two, 
the variable looks very attractive in comparison to the fixed interest rates because, I mean, who doesn't want a 1.24% interest rate, right? But remember, don't be Heather <laughs> and don't get tricked because it does have, there's literally no rhyme or reason. They reserve the right to raise it at any time. So initially when you do, um, your application for the private loan, you may get an interest rate variable or fixed. It applies to both in mm -hmm. those ranges. So their fixed interest rates vary between these two numbers, whereas their variable rates vary between these two. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know that you have decent credit or your, your co-signer does, you know, the are you going to gamble? It's really if you're a gambler. <laughs> um, I said, I honestly would never recommend anyone to do a variable interest rate just because I had such a, a bad experience. But you can um, also sort by the lowest um, APR, the lowest interest rate, um, so that it shows you uh, which one has the lowest versus highest. I mean, obviously, you wouldn't I mean, if you have personal reasons to go with Commerce Bank, for example, maybe um, your parents or you have a relationship with them or like Affinity Credit Union, maybe you already bank with them. It's always good to contact your branch to see if they offer something for members already, like people who are members already versus people who are signing up to be members only for this purpose. Um, but like I said, otherwise, if you have no biases towards um, towards them, then I would always, you know, shoot for the one with the lowest. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you so much. Perfect, no problem. All right. So we are going to hop into repayment now. Um, before I do that, I, is there any questions before we get into repayment about loans or anything like that from anyone? That's okay. If not, I just want to give space for it. I don't think so at the moment. Okay. And feel free to put your questions in the chat if they come up or, you know, even if it's not off on the topic of what the slide is, that's okay too. Um, so diving in, I did dissect repayment quite a bit. Um, so again, providing this as a recording, you guys will be able to go back and forth uh, throughout it rather than, you know, having me rewind live. That's not a thing I can offer. <laughs> um, but so knowing which repayment plan uh, is, is best for you is a personal decision. And it is not going to, I can guarantee you, it is not going to be the same year one of repayment as it is year five of repayment. Um, life changes, things happen. Uh, promotions happen, layoffs happen, children happen, home debt, personal debt, all the things happen. Um, every year you do have to recertify um, for your repayment plan. Um, I am going to, moving forward, speak solely to the federal loans, although um, I will put notes in of where like uh, private and alternative loans um, apply as well. Um, so basically, you're, you're, these are all federal options. Um, the thing that's great about the federal loans is that they do offer such a flexible repayment, whereas you may not have as many options with a private lender. Um, and that's something to consider, and that's something that's really important to ask. Um, that way you're not getting yourself into something um, right off the bat that's going to be, could potentially be detrimental for you. Um, so knowing if your private lender has like a grace period and thing is, is, um, is, is useful. Um, repayment plans will vary based on, again, your personal choices. So some things that you can consider is, how quickly you hope to pay off your loans. Um, so for students who have really low loan balances, um, that's probably what you wanna do, right? Like you probably did whatever you had to apply till you were blue in the face for scholarships and grants and stuff, or, or maybe you took longer in school so that you could have pay out of pocket and maybe you don't have that much loans and you wanna pay them off quick. Or maybe you have a lot of debt, but you have a great job out of um, straight out the gate 
after graduation. So um, you want to consider your salary or your income, um, whatever that is to base it off of. Um, also think about the work that you do and even your marital status and household size. So like if you are married or getting married, um, then you would therefore um, commonly, not always, sharing finances, um, things like that. So um, just some things to, to think about or that are important and can impact um, what you do. And I'll kind of get into these in just a few slides. Um, and we are just doing our best to try to highlight big picture. Um, so right out the gate, when a student graduates, um, you will typically receive a letter and or email um, about the standard repayment of your federal loans. And so this provides like this is available on um, the Department of Education's website. It's actually now all under the same website, which is studentaid.gov. Um, and that's where you, you literally do everything on that website now. You apply for FAFSA, you um, do your entrance counseling master promissory note, manage your repayment. Um, all of that stuff is done through that one site. Um, so in orange, there is the standard and graduated uh, repayment plan. So it does show you um, base dollar amounts. Um, this is, if you see like the caveat down at the bottom, um, this is for a $30,000 unsubsidized loan with a 5% interest rate for a single individual um, with an income around 30,000. So again, this is just simply just trying to make it simple to show people the visual um, about things that can vary. Um, so for example, the standard, you're going to pay the same dollar amount for 120 payments, which is 10 years. Um, it will take you whatever your total balance is, whether it's 30,000 or 60,000 and divide it into 120. <clears throat> Sorry, I like have to cough and I couldn't find the mute button. <laughs> you're good. I'm not used to talking so much <laughs> anymore. Um, but so you would pay the same. So here um, in your first month, you pay 318. In your last month, you pay 318 with a total amount here. Um, and again, that's for 120 months. The graduated payment plan, which we'll get into in just a few slides, um, that's an option. What it does is it progressively increases your payment per month based on uh, the assumption that you're going to year to year make more money. Um, that's kind of like in an ideal world. I don't really know. I personally don't know anybody that's ever done the graduated plan, um, but I'm sure that there are people out there. So you will see they'll start lower at $180, but then by the end they would pay 540 a month. Um, and that's to get everything paid off in 120 months. Um, but you can see they're going to pay a little bit more. That's just because when they're starting, they're not paying a lot towards their interest that has, that is accruing. Um, and they may only be making a small dent in their principal balance, which is like the, uh, the balance without the interest calculated in. Whereas by the last month, they're paying predominantly um, they're paying the interest rate and the that towards that principal. And then down here in the blue, these are definitely the more, I feel, realistic options. Um, there's a pay as you earn, um, there's a revised pay as you earn, um, income based or IBR. Um, and there, which ones you actually um, are eligible for, there are plenty of tools on the website. Um, again, studentaid.gov. Um, I just realized that I need to update that. Uh, I apologize. But studentaid.gov, um, you can, uh, there's plenty of like repayment calculators. Um, you can also answer a series of questions uh, when you go for that um, recertification each year for your repayment plan based on what your financial situation is 
um, it will tell you what is base, what is what seems best. And then you can determine if you can make a $152 payment or if that's a little high and you are more comfortable with the 102 payment. Again, these are totally just um, generic numbers. For example, um, I when I graduated college, I also lived in a much cheaper state, um, but I was only making $23,000 and I had about $20,000 in student debt. Um, I know I could not make my standard repayment, which I think was $150 a month. Um, you know, I had a car payment, I had insurance, phone bill, living expenses, all that. So I couldn't afford literally anything, um, it, it, at least right out the gate. So I um, did the income-based repayment. I provided them with my taxes and I was only required to pay $38 a month. And so I was remaining in good standing with my loans. I was paying towards them. Um, even though it was much less than what I thought was acceptable, it was acceptable because they saw it for what it was, right? I There's no way I could have afforded um, to pay $150 at the time. I mean, I was barely making a livable wage. Um, so they worked with me. Now, if um, something had happened, you can contact them um, and maybe they'll decide that um, a $0 payment is suffice um, for the time being, those things happen. Right now, um, all loan repayment is essentially frozen or what's called forbearance. Um, and that just means because we are in a, a country state of emergency with the pandemic worldwide um, emergency, it's 0% interest rate accumulating right now. Um, and no one is required to uh, re be making their repayments every month. That has extended a couple times as well. Um, right now it expires September 30th of 2021. So that helps students who are currently taking out loans because it's not accruing interest, but it also um, is helping people like me who um, I am working. Uh, but it's it's giving me a sense of relief. Um, now, I certainly can make payments um, as I want, and I can decide those amounts, but they kind of like relieve the entire country of that pressure right now because we're dealing with so much. Um, if your goal is to repay your loans quickly and you can afford the fixed amount every month, then the standard repayment may be the best option for you. Um, but just know again that um, you do have the option to select a different repayment plan, but you do want to do that as soon as they notify you about repayment being due. You do not want to drag your feet on it. Um, I always tell students it, it's really frustrating and you may like want to put it off. You don't want to deal with it, uh, but it is absolutely crucial. Um, they are there to work with us. Like I said, I, um, I actually know that one somebody in our office in the leadership position at one point um they were being considered on time and they had a zero dollar payment uh, <clears throat> and given everything that was going on in their life that was that li literally saved them probably from a mental breakdown because how am i going to afford this and i want to be current but i can't afford anything and so they're there but you have to advocate for yourself Federal government does not know what you're struggling with. <laughs> so this is just an example, um, year one through 10 of like, you're making the same dollar amount. Um, I realize that you guys probably weren't seeing my mouse. <laughs> um, the same dollar amount across the board for 10 years. Um, so this is your loans would be paid off in 10 years, um, unless you decided to consolidate them you would pay the same fixed interest rate every month for the 10 years or 120 payments. Um, if you don't qualify for loan forgiveness, which we're gonna go into, I promise, in detail in a couple slides from now, um, this is typically the quickest and most cost-effective way to repay your loans. Um, and it's just simple because you, if you enroll in direct deposit or um, direct debit, I'm sorry, uh, where they take the money from your bank account every month, you can set it up. That way it happens automatically and you just 
re do the recertification every year, which they use the data retrieval tool similar to the FAFSA so that you can submit your taxes and just validate um, that you're still good to stay in this payment plan or they may offer, say, if you have a reduction, they may offer something, um, suggest something maybe suitable, more suitable or better for you. Again, only you can make that choice. The graduated repayment plan, <clears throat> I do recommend this. Uh, it's recommended commonly for people who won't qualify for loan forgiveness, um, but do want to um, like ease, like easily go through, like increase every two years um, over the 10 year period. Um, that does, again, that's a set amount for each year. Um, it does increase every two years, as you can see, um, but with the plan to pay off in 10 years. Income-driven repayment plans, this is my favorite. This is what I've been in since I was, since I entered repayment. Um, and again, you can set your payment at a percentage of your income, um, is, is that's how they do it. It is, I believe, 10 to 20% of your income um, or less. Uh, usually, almost always will have a lower payment than the standard repayment or other plans. Um, and you can have payments as low as $0 per month. And then that does go year by year, it can change. What your income-driven repayment is not permanent for the whole time that you're paying loans, um, but it is gonna be that 10 to 20% of your income each year as you go. You do have to recertify or recalculate every year um, and they prompt you for that. They, I believe, give you like a three month heads up um, that it's coming due so you have time um, to do it and you, you get that reminder, which is really life-saving to me because how can we keep up with all the things, right? So um, the income-driven repayment plan is typically for a repayment period of 20 to 25 years. Um, and this is where we're gonna, we're gonna hop into uh, um, loan forgiveness here and just a few slides. Um, but here the visual is, uh, so the yellow here is showing the amount that you're paying towards your loan and the green is the income. So it's just showing you that your income may fluctuate, right? You may have uh, career changes, you may um, have children and not work as much, you may have an illness and not work as much or maybe not work at all, things like that, life happens. So again, it's just showing you that it can fluctuate. And the yellow, again, represents your payment under this um, and your remaining income for the year. Um, down below, uh, this is a good example of just showing you that, you know, maybe you're in your undergraduate and you set up for the income driven repayment plan for the first 20 years, and then you decide to go to graduate school. Um, and when you graduate, you typically will accumulate more debt as a graduate student. Um, but that was just added on. So the good thing is that you can have, technically you have um, a new loan, a new federal loan every single year, um, but you only repay one time. Like you're only paying it monthly one time instead of tracking the loan that you paid, you got freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, senior year. You're not paying four different people or four different amounts you are paying just one payment and it applies to all the loans that you have, which is convenient and easy to track. Now, if you have federal loans and a private loan, you would then have two lenders. Um, so I had two lenders. I just paid off my private loan last year. Not proud of how long it took me, <laughs> but was, especially when that 11% kicked in, it totally kicked my butt and extended it way more than I planned. Uh, but but I it. finally got there. Yep, <laughs> finally got there. Um, and for comparison, I paid that off in 2020 and I graduated in 2014. I got that loan in 10 years prior, just, and that was only $5,000. I feel much better and like, feel like I'm making more progress on my federal loans 
Um, and the thing is just like, what makes me feel good is that I'm making progress um, towards paying them off. And I don't feel like I'm being reprimanded for borrowing any amount of money. Private loan, I don't know, it felt like a hovering dark cloud. Um, yeah. But I absolutely needed it. And that was my only choice. Um, I don't regret it. I just wish that I had better education. So hence why I love doing these presentations. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Heather, I just wanted to tell you really quick, we have about five minutes left. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to, um, again, provide the PowerPoint um, so that you can share it how you want. Um, I will skip forward a little bit because uh, I, yeah, I did not time this well. Apologies. It's okay. So public service loan Good forgiveness. <laughs> it's so much. Um, public service loan forgiveness um, is a very hot topic um, for everyone because uh, essentially what it is, is you make 120 payments um, and that does not have to be consecutive. Um, that can be throughout your, your lifetime. And once you make that 120th payment, ideally, as long as you have been employed under those 120 payments, um, you may qualify for forgiveness, which is any amount of debt that is remaining of your federal loans will be wiped out, essentially. There are a lot of cave, uh, caveats to that. Um, so I have provided the information um, there is also in the state of Colorado, a teacher loan forgiveness program. Um, it is always important to uh, check the state that you're in right now. That is uh, what is offered here in Colorado. Um, so the next one's just kind of go through the example of um, who are qualifying employers. And again, uh, the details of the teacher loan forgiveness. Um, it does answer the question of like what, who qualifies for this, what kind of, what's that definition. Um, loan consolidation is not for everyone, but that's basically where people um, consolidate all of their loans. Say you have private loans with Discover and you got your federal loans and you want to put it all in one lump sum instead of paying two different lenders. Um, however, it's a, it's a financial decision. Um, it does take an average interest rate. Um, so you may get a lower interest rate, you may get a little higher, but it may make more sense for you. Um, and they will tell you if it's a good, um, well, I like to think that the federal site um, gives you, cause I thought about consolidation. I had no idea of what it was. And I looked into it and I, it told me like, debt consolidation is not a good option for you. <laughs> Consider doing an income payment the income driven repayment plan. And that is the route that I went. So I'm glad that that provided it for me. Um, this is a sneak peek into the federal website I referenced earlier, the studentaid.gov. It's super cool because it will show the total loan amount that you have, as well as the grants that you've received, um, which is just kind of, it's like, oh, well, you know, this much paid for my education that I didn't have to pay. So that's awesome. Um, and then I just highlighted a couple of things. So decide whether your consolidation loan is for you. Um, the repayment calculator is here. Your contact information should always be up to date. Um, explore your repayment options. All of those tools are there. Um, it also gives you a checklist based on where you are in life. So if you're preparing uh, for school as an as incoming freshman, or if you're in school or you're in your repayment stage. Uh, basically, if you decide to continue education, as long as you are half-time enrolled, you will be eligible for in, what's called in-school deferment. So you are not required to make payments, although your interest uh, will accrue. Um, you will not be mandated to pay that while you're in school. Um, some people will choose to uh, pay on their interest um, as they go. There are some tips on De avoiding default that I'll skip through, um, as well as some tips for uh, financial wellness. Again, uh, the automatic debit. Um, you can deduct your student loan interest paid on your taxes, uh, some things like that. It does also give you an example of if you can make extra loan payments. However, that's considering that you don't have other bills. 
Um, so if you pay off your car, you can pay on more of your student loans, for example. Also just provided um, just resources from the institution, career services, employment search um, assistance is available. And it's important to always ask, like if you think that you're going into a field um, of public service, uh, whether that be a nonprofit or government agency, um, asking if they qualify for public service loan forgiveness is a big important topic um, to ask and know of, especially if you're someone um, who's entering a field that maybe does not have a lot of um, a high salary, for example. Um, I always use teachers. Educators are not often compensated properly, in my personal opinion, um, nor does it usually match their debt that they take out. Um, other fields like social work that require a master's for you to even do entry-level work um, I usually have high debts but low income. So it's important to see if you qualify for that. Again, another tool. Um, this, Sam, is that big packet that we had outside of our office when we were in person. Um, it is a large document, but I did provide the link that provides like the, the PDF version of it, so it's not printed. And then our contact information. Cool. Thank you so much, Heather. This was a lot yeah. of really important information. I appreciate it. I'm going to stay on the call for a little bit longer. I see that it's 12. And if you all have questions, feel free to ask. If you felt too shy, that's OK. You can still ask. Maybe if more people leave, you might feel more comfortable. But let's go ahead and say thanks to Aunt, to Heather. I was about to say Amber. <laughs> Heather in the chat. And you can also click the little smiley face button, and it gives you a reaction. And you can either clap or put one of the other emoji kind of things on there for Heather. So thank you, Heather, very much. Yeah, no problem. Sorry, I did not time well. <laughs> there's there's so much information on this stuff. And 